think we're going to go ahead and do is start um, this meeting as a subcommittee. Uh, so, do we usually call roll? Go ahead and call, start the roll call, and we'll catch up on that later. Senator Lowenthal, Senator Hancock, Senator Huff, Assemblymember Fuller, Assemblymember Brownlee, Assemblymember Buchanan, Here. Scott Harvey, Present. Kathleen Moore, Here. Lynn Green, Here. Cynthia Bryant. Here. Okay, then. Um, I just want to remind um, members and um, staff and any speakers that come to the table that everybody has to speak into one of these microphones today in order for the court reporter to hear us and accurately transcribe the meeting. So I think what I'd like to go ahead and do is start with, um, first of all, tab 11 is pulled from the agenda. Um, we'll hear that at our, ne at our next meeting. Um, I think what we'll go ahead and do is start um, with tab uh, tab 15, which is a report on high performance incentive grants, which I'll actually just do myself really quickly. Um, we have had pr very productive meetings on this issue between the D DSA and CHIPS and myself. We've been meeting regularly. I think we're going to get to a point next week where we can finish up, and uh, I'll keep the members posted. It's our intent to bring back the final report at the next at our next regularly scheduled meeting, and I don't think we'll have a problem with that. Um, so that's that report. So tab 16, um, do we need an, any comment on tab 16? Lisa, is there anything to present on tab 16? Oh, yes. Sorry. Dave Zian will be up here and present on this item. Thanks for waking me up. Madam Chair, members of the board, the purpose of this report is to provide the extreme hardship survey results that were directed by the board a year ago uh, in April of 2009. As background, due to uh, revisions of the Budget Act in the Deferred Maintenance Program, the funding was decreased. For Some of you will remember this. I'm, some of you may not. But the funding was decreased from $277.4 million to $240.6 million. And this funding decrease necessitated board action relative to the amounts that would be provided for extreme hardship projects. And it was decided at that time in April of 2009 to fund on an incremental basis for a period of five years, and we're in the middle of that right now, by the way, at a 21% amount. So if you do five times 21, you get to 105. So that's the weird percentages in this item. Um, to this end, 126 extreme hardship projects were approved by the board last year in April, and they were funded incrementally at that 21% amount at that time. And there was also a stipulation to staff that they survey districts a year later. And so staff has, after, so in April and May of this year, 2010, staff surveyed school districts. They developed four core questions. And the questions were all related to the questions that the board had last year relative to whether or not a school district could proceed with this incremental um, extreme hardship funding that was provided at that time. So the survey questions were developed and the survey um, went on. And if I would spend a few seconds here and just talk about the questions themselves that go after the core question. The first question that was uh, asked of school districts in the survey was whether or not the school district could proceed with the project as intended. Secondarily, the current status of the project. Thirdly, how the district proceeded and the type of financing that was utilized in the extreme hardship project. And lastly, the reason the district was unable to proceed with the project. So as far as some of the data related to the survey, 112 districts were affected by this um, direction by the board and they were surveyed. 93 of the 112 districts actually responded, indicating an 83% district response rate, very high rate, that's good. And in those 112 districts, that comprised 126 uh, extreme hardship projects, of which we received 106 
uh, comments related to that in the survey, again indicating a very high response rate of 84 percent. Now as far as on the second page of this item, there is a lot more granularity as far as the data, the questions and the nuances. We put them into different categories and percentages, but I'll distill it for you for the sake of brevity right now. And 65 percent of the districts through this survey process indicated that, that they would proceed with their extreme hardship projects as intended. Breaking that down further, that 65 percent amount, uh, indicated 39 percent of the districts are proceeding incrementally uh, with funding uh, available through the DMP. Another 35 percent are proceeding with other district funds and as funding is made available through the deferred maintenance program. And lastly, 15 percent used alternative financing. So that's, that's the report. Do I have any questions at this point? Any questions, Mr. Harvey? I've got to assume that deferred maintenance is an important and high priority. You're trying to correct something. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me, if you can, on question number four, that C category where they were utilizing the funds for other educational purposes? Mm -hmm. What would those be and how would they be more important than deferred maintenance? Um, in some cases, the projects are not ready to go ahead, uh, Mr. Harvey. Uh, there may be planning. There may be decisions about how to address the particular extreme hardship. Um, I'm not sure if there are other issues beyond that, um, but I, I think that's the primary reason. They just weren't ready at the time, so it's a sequencing thing. Do you have any idea what those other educational purposes were? Um, not not offhand, but I can certainly look into it if you'd like me to. Would they be consistent with other financial hardship needs? Is there some requirement, or can it be absolutely I, anything? I think, like I think the salary? answer could be yes. I think it could be consistent with that. We'll have an offline. If you can get me a little more. Sure. sure. Oh, Chris has some information. Why don't you just whisper in my ear? I do. Chris Ferguson, Department of Finance. Among other things, the uh, school districts were provided the flexibility uh, through uh, statutes uh, to use that for other educational purposes, including uh, keeping teachers on the job, uh, providing for books for students or educational materials, um, among other things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, then we'll um, move on to tab 17. But I, will, I do want to say something about all these information items that we're hearing in the absence of the members is that DGS and OPSC have volunteered to come and brief any member on any one of these items if they miss the presentation. So um, staff that's listening are in the room, we'll make sure we circle back with everyone. And so if anybody has individual questions they don't get to ask here, we can uh, deal with those individually. Um, okay, uh, tab 17. Yes, um, the purpose of this item is to inform you excuse me, to form the Board of the Administrative Cost Allocations that we have spent to administer the program for 2009-2010 fiscal year. Staff would like to advise the Board that the initial Budget Act allocations to administer the program was budgeted for $15.9 million. As you may note that our budget was reduced to nearly $13.8 million to comply with the budget letters, the Governor's Executive Order, and the Budget Act control sections. The amounts provided to the line item appropriations include the cost allocated to administer the school facilities program of over $13 million, the relocatable classroom program of over $264,000, state school deferred maintenance program $142,000 and $320,000 for general fund for emergency repair program. Additionally, the cost, excuse me, the amounts reported on in the report are exclusively those of OPSL and exclude the cost of the State Controller's Office, California School Finance Authority, the Treasurer's Office, or California, yeah, which is they do the financial soundness test, and the California Department of Education. So this is, again, exclusively of OPSC's cost. We also included in the report the attachment uh, on page 20, 226, and actually is a breakdown of the budgeted cost versus the actual cost incurred for the program. For two budget years, fiscal year 2008, 2009, 2009, and 2010. And if you follow your way down, 
your right hand column as you can see for 2009 2010 budget year we obviously have a surplus meaning we were budgeted for 13.7 or almost 13.8 million dollars to expend for the program and we only actually spent 12.8 so we have a surplus of nearly a million dollars or nine hundred fifty one thousand dollars so what does that all mean um, staff save seven percent of the total budget that means that there are additional monies available to fund construction projects so that's great news staff has also added additional detail and you will see it in attachment two which is on stamp page 227 realize I understand that came in today but that obviously provides a little bit level higher level detail to some of the line items that um, there may be questions on with that um, staff has been prudent in expenditure of the bonds the overall cost used to administer the program for this 35 billion dollar program has been only 0.62 percent or approximately 217 million dollars over the last 11 years Likewise, it, if you compare, can I interrupt you for one second. Is sure. that so? That's but that's for the entire. That includes everybody's costs, right? Okay. CSFA, DOF, that's, that's correct. CDE, okay. that's correct. And so, likewise, if you compare the expenditure of other strategic growth plan, uh, growth bonds, there's a set aside reserve of two percent. So compare OPSC's cost to administer the program it includes all the other costs, 0.62. It's relatively small fraction of what the other bond programs charge. So again, staff will continue to provide quarterly reports, um, to, again, as more of a transparency to report out the, how the bonds funds are being expended. So at this time, we're requesting the board to accept this report. Are there any questions from board members? Sir, go ahead. Thank you, Lisa. It looks like 100, 100, 159 PYs. Is that fully staffed, or what, what would be? Would, and it looks like there's savings in the in the staffing numbers, correct? That's, that's correct. So I'm, my assumption is you aren't fully staffed, but we what have, would fully staffed be? We have 37 uh, percent. We have 37, excuse me, positions that are vacant. 37. Yeah. Any other questions? Is there any public comment on this item? I have a question. So, so how many unfilled positions did you have the previous year? I can flip through some information. Um, our vacancy rate in 2009 was four, we had 14 vacancies in 2009. So the rate of vacancy was 8%. And the reason for the additional vacancies? This year from last year? Well, obviously there was a, um, we have a high turnover. Um, there's a, a lot of pressure and you know to right. administer the program so with that people promote up to other opportunities so it's hard to explain why the reason why there is a tone of yeah there were uh, Matt Pitcherlinga um, admin manager for the office of public school construction so yes uh, Lisa did address that but there were 14 vacancies last year um, that we had and again there's been a uh, governor's order that was issued in July of 2008 um, that said that there was no hiring and then DGS also had an internal hiring freeze issued in July of 2009 so that um, was one of the reasons why we also did not fill any positions since then but currently we do have a number of postings internally um, of positions being filled okay. yeah, those have gone through the exemption process that had gone all the way up for approval so again there are we we did attempt to go through the uh, exemption process but they were denied at that point but um, these now are, are being uh, allowed to be filled any other questions okay next is tab 18 but I don't see mr. Amos here yet oh yes oh sorry I didn't you snuck in okay so tab 18 update on the OPSC DSA program review Thank you, Madam Chair and distinguished board members. Opportunity to get back to you and represent what has been an ongoing process. This is the second um, presentation to the State Allocation Board and serves as an update in terms of where we are with our program review. Uh, what I'd like to articulate is, is that the process has been uh, very successful. I am proud to say that we, I jointly chair this process with Kathleen Moore. Uh, she serves as vice chair of this process. 
Beginning in August 5th through the August 12th, we had half-day meetings with the subcommittee uh, working, group, uh, working groups. And through that process, what we were able to identify was a series of uh, proposed changes or modifications or concerns that have been forwarded to us. There is a blue presentation that's before you, and I apologize for not mentioning that sooner. But in the document, it articulates that each of the subgroups, which were comprised of customers and stakeholders and representatives, uh, focused on one aspect of the school construction process, that is planning, design, plan review, uh, funding, bidding and construction, or move-in, closeouts. So in each one of those areas, they had a charter in which they were to respond to. Um, each of the working subgroups was successful in accomplishing that. They articulated up to 10 concerns, including the identification of short-term, interim, and long-term proposed solutions to address these concerns. Again, these are represented in the chartered documents that are in this document um, and are posted currently. On August 18th, uh, DSA and OPSC's uh, expert working group reviewed the chartered documents in keeping with um, the State Allocation Board's recommendations <laughs> that we be careful not to uh, focus on a uh, stovepipe type perspective, but to look across the board and look for um, horizontal interfaces or opportunities to affect change. Uh, we identified a series of areas where we can um, extrapolate or communicate that across program areas there's issues to be addressed, and that's towards the end of the document here under the summary pieces. What I will say is, is that the meeting on the 18th was most productive, a lot of conversation about those commonalities, ex uh, exploring with the subgroup chairs what those commonalities may be and how they interpreted and or would communicate proposed solutions. We anticipate um, continuing through this process. Our next meeting is on September 8th. There is a calendar of events that is identified in the back of the document. Um, it articulates that this next meeting will be focused largely on, again, exploring that, um, that, that matrix or excuse me, that matrix of the various cross-cutting issues. And then our intention is, is to uh, further uh, flush out which of those particular issues could be synthesized or collapsed into commonalities. Uh, currently, we have approximately 46 different areas of focus. We envision that through this process, we will continue to um, narrow those down to common areas, common themes, and hopefully uh, provide for a more streamlined understanding of the process. The scope of the program, of the scope of the program review has been reduced to postpone the areas of audit, appeals, and performance measures. This was by agreement and in partnership with the State Allocation Board that these are areas that we would postpone at this time and give the State Allocation Board opportunity to uh, finalize its work in its various subcommittees and to bring to ensure that we give adequate time and consideration to those. I will also articulate that the highlights of a subgroup customer service, including an average rating of 4.3 on a scale of 1 to 5, 5 being excellent for the program review, demonstrated that the customers, the individuals that were involved in the subcommittees felt that this was representative of their work and that the process supported the continuation of these efforts. Well, I recognize this is a lot of information being made available to you with very few moments to uh, share them. I would like to make sure that I give you an ample opportunity to ask me any questions that may be before you at this time. Are there any questions for Mr. Amos? Any, any, did you want to add anything, Madam Co-Chair? No, it's been a, a pleasure to be part of the process. I think there's a, a number of people at the table that are providing um, insights into the way that that program could operate um, better. I think there's going to be, um, you'll find that there'll be results that fall into the category of it's going to need a legislative um, fix. Um, it could possibly have an administrative fix or um, it may be a regulatory um, fix. So I think it's it's going to fall across those those um, areas. And then I just personally think that it um, support that that we are giving the state allocation board the opportunity in the three areas that you mentioned um, to for, to complete their work um, before any work at the expert level. I think this is a lot to chunk off as it is, um, and probably concentrating our efforts there um, are are going to be. Uh, better in the long run. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you. Again, we'll, and Stephen is always available for calls from any board members that have questions or concerns about the process. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I did note, though, I do note that I would not have survived with ground rule number four, which is no personal communication devices. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, all right, so back to, let's go back and, Lisa, why don't we do tab three, your um, executive officer statement. Will do. Um, I'd like to highlight a few items uh, to the board tonight is uh, our priorities and funding round, fund release requests. It's obviously, we wanted to share with you that um, we just met, met two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, and we provided active apportionments for 78 projects at our last meeting. And to date, we received requests for 49 projects, which <coughs> represents 62.8% of those uh, projects provided apportionments, which represents $320 million out of the $408 million. So that's great news for the program. Um, we actually are notifying those districts who haven't submitted a fund release. Uh, we sent them an email blast today to remind them of the timelines and the deadlines. And so we'll be encouraging districts to come in, perhaps on a monthly basis. And we're, we're hoping by next month we'll have good news that all the money has been expended for the program. So that's great. We're excited about that. Other questions? Do you want to ask a question about that? No. Okay. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> At the smiling. smiling. Oh, you're smiling. That's great news. <laughs> yeah. Look, can I ask? I do want to. Let me ask since we're going to stop for a second. Um, so what is your plan for contacting, working with the 19 districts? Are you going to start a more personal contact program than just emails at this point? Well, what we did small to, universe. Right. What we did today was send them an email notification uh, specifically to those districts. So that was the first form of reach out. Um, what we plan to do is I will ensure that staff will call them up next week mm -hmm. to walk them through the mm -hmm. process if there's anything that they're unclear about. Um, you know, so again, we want to provide more effort and communication with them if they're unclear about the process. I'm always sensitive to putting extra work on the staff, but I think that it'd be nice. I'm assuming this night, the number 19 is going to be significantly smaller by the time we get to our next meeting on October 6th. So maybe you can report to us what some of the barriers are, what your sense is of why districts haven't submitted their paperwork so that the board can be understand you know some of the challenges some of the challenges they're facing yeah yeah we'll certainly work with districts and and disclose to you all the members about what the challenges are okay thanks so we also wanted to update the, we've been doing a lot of enhancements in the area of, of our website um, again I know DSA actually has a tracking mechanism that add more transparency to their projects likewise we want to mimic something that we can also share with our stakeholders and our interested parties of where they're at in the process. So again, the goal is to provide this uh, new website enhancement, hopefully deploy it by the end of September. Again, it gives more level transparency as where districts are in the process as far as how we're processing their um, applications. And it's also a useful management tool so we can find out if there's any issues or any barriers that we are experiencing in the process of um, processing their application. And again, tonight we produced um, as we mentioned at the last meeting, the first financial report. And the goal is to obviously provide another layer of transparency. We're willing to obviously meet with some of the members that weren't here tonight um, and obviously report back on a quarterly basis. So the goal is to report back um, at the November meeting for the next report. And in our item tonight, we're also sharing high performance grants. Uh, we provided 17 applications of $1.1 .1 million, also considered in your consent calendar. And the workload plan, there also is attached, uh, page 16, 17, and 18 is your 90-day workload review. Um, again, we also added the updates to the facility hardship log requests and appeals. Um, an item that we wanted to highlight for next month is we're going to be having an after-action report for Calexico. So we'll, we're hopefully be joined by Cal Lima at that, at that board meeting. With that, I'll open up the questions. Any, are there any questions for Ms. Silverman? The last item again. Lisa, that Calexico is going to do what? It's an after action report on the, the earthquake um, relationship and how we communicated with districts. We're hoping to have a more comprehensive plan to share with our stakeholders about how we could provide them services or have a better emergency plan response um, for them during these. Oh, so it's not Calexico no, reporting, no. it's you about after action after. on the earthquake. Thank yeah. you. OK, 
Okay, any other questions? Well, that leaves me with no choice but to go back, begin going through our action items, and we'll just leave the roll, roll call open. Um, can we vote with it? Can we start voting when we only have five of us here? I actually don't know the answer to that question. Okay. All right. Good. Then we'll go ahead and we'll take up tab two, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any questions or comments? Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, go ahead and call the roll. Assembly Member Buchanan. Aye. Scott Harvey. Aye. Kathleen Moore. Aye. Lynn Green. Aye. Cynthia Bryant. Aye. Um, next is tab four, the consent agenda. Are there any questions or changes? Do we take some? Oh, we took some. We're taking some. Yeah, we took an item off. Which item? We. In the consent calendar, something coming off, or is it somewhere else? The rescission. Is the rescission? That was eleven. That was eleven. That was eleven. I thought I saw a note somewhere that something was off consent. Yeah, we're gonna we were gonna remove an item from the consent agenda and it related to a district that submitted a request last night, in Orange County. Oh right. So right. which is so okay. So that's off. Is that off? Yes. Okay. So the orange. So. Is it is the calendar as it's in tab? I'm sorry. This is like I get these emails and they stick in my head. So is the consent calendar as it's in the in um, tab four? Does it include that project or not include that project? Same. Sorry, that's okay. We'll clarify that. Okay, so. So page so it's a consent calendar minus pages 144 and 145. Is there a motion on that? It's just to strike out that one project. Right. right. On page 145. Okay, strike. we're striking the project on page 145. But we're keeping Victor Valley Union. Correct. Uh, that's what we're doing. So right. We're, okay. I would move approval of the consent calendar as amended to strike Orange County Office of Education. Just a comment, I'll be voting on all items except the Outgrove Unified School District item. Uh, Assembly Member Buchanan, aye. Scott Harvey, aye. Kathleen Moore, with the exception, aye. Lynn Green, aye. Cynthia Bryant, aye. Okay, I just realized tabs five and six are reports too. We could have done those, but go ahead. <laughs> so, um, can I draw your attention to tab five? Gosh, we're making great progress here. That's great news. Um, we wanted to, to highlight um, the activity that's been happening with our fund releases, and you turn over to really tab page 154. The summary of the fund releases that have been um, processed this month is 97.8 million, which is great news. Um, again, great activity for the program, but obviously with the incoming of those projects for uh, priorities of funding round, we anticipate those numbers to go up. So um, we reported out that we received $320 million uh, of fund release requests for that priorities of funding round. So obviously we're in the process of processing those items. So we imagine that those things will be reflected in the next item, uh, next month's report. But what can I draw your attention to page 155? And here's the, the bar chart regarding to the cash. Um, last month we reported that we had 1.4 billion dollars in cash available and this month's activity we obviously had a significant amount of releases so we still have 1.3 billion dollars in uh, cash that are ready to be released and that again relates to active apportionment so um, again the need is that we need to make some activity and movement in the program and <laughs> obviously if there's any barriers with why projects aren't moving forward um, we would love to hear from districts to figure out what are the barriers um, we actually received in 2009 $2.6 billion in bond proceeds and in 2010 $1.3 billion as reflective of the March sale. So that was nearly $4 billion in cash this program has received. So out of the 2009 allocations, we released 81% of those funds. So of a, we have dispersed $2.1 billion and we still have $500 million available um, in the 2009 bond proceeds. <coughs> and for the March 2010 
we released 531 million and we have still 820 million available to be released for cash. So again, we want to encourage districts to come in um, who have active apportionments, um, to, again, to make access to that cash and, and move that money out so we can stimulate the economy. I'll open it up for any questions. A very quick one. I, I guess I'm going to be very interested in the uh, program review funding committee activities because I think one of their charters is to take a look at the obstacles. And you alluded, Ms. Silverman, to the fact that here we are at 1.3 billion and we're not apportioning. And we'd like to hear from districts about what those barriers are. I assume we're going to, and then we're also going to have some short-term, medium-term, and long-term fixes. But it, it is. It is ironic <laughs> that we have this cash and uh, we have need, and yet we're not able to actually physically spend it. Yeah, and, and a good point that we wanted to share is um, obviously a good part of the 2009 proceeds that were um, have been dispersed um, obviously relate to a huge number uh, that was $2.4 billion that was held back because we did have active commitments or apportionments back before the freeze in December 2008. So obviously we had enough cash to cover those interests and so that's why there is a huge depletion of those funds. So that's great. But 2010, we just received those bond proceeds in March 2010. We obviously cleared all the certifications. So again, those are that's new money that's going to be introduced. So I mean, it's basically that that money has only been there for a few months. So we're hoping that we had a big spur. If you look at the chart in June 2010, 504 million, we're hoping to have a, another big spur in cash being released as a result of the 320 million that we received for the fund release, um, the funding, the new funding round. Is the June spike coincide with summer vacation and the fact that you can? perhaps build more easily on a school site? Is that historically, is there a spike in June? We think the spike came in as a result of the uh, certifications and cash becoming available. We think that's where the splurge came in. But has in. more to do with that than right, right. school timing. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Did you go over tab six too? No. Okay, tab six then. Okay, tab six um, is our status of funds report. What we wanted to highlight today in Proposition 1D that we are processed $4.2 million for new construction that represents six projects. And we're also <coughs> processing $54 million that represents 34 projects. And high performance, $1.2 million, that's 17 projects. And overcrowding relief, uh, $6.4 million or one project. And in charter school, we're also processing $9.8 million in unfunded approval. So that represents $75.6 million of unfunded approvals for Proposition 1D. And in your center category is uh, highlighted in green. That's Proposition 55. We're processing $0.2 million, which represents four projects in new construction. We're converting some critically overcrowded school projects of $109.3 million. That represents seven projects. So in total, for the activity for Proposition 55, we have 109.5 that represented in unfunded approvals in the consent calendar. And for Proposition 47, we're processing 43 million or 13 new construction applications um, in that category. So in total, we're processing in the consent agenda 228 million in unfunded approvals this month. So that brings the total between that column and the column next to it, the two billion, we have 2.2 billion dollars in unfunded approvals. So if I can take you to the following page. Uh, we did have the slight activity in Proposition 1A, which is rare that we see this activi activity. We actually are going to provide an unfunded approval of $0.9 million um, this month in that category. So again, in total, it's uh, $229 million of unfunded approvals. And the middle category is our processing of emergency repair program. We're processing this month 20.6 million, which represents 46 projects. So that brings a total cash need for the emergency repair program of $136 million. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Are there any questions, Ms. Silverman? Okay, is there any public comment on tabs five or six? Okay, then we'll move on to the consent specials. 
Um, without objection, we'll take up tab seven, eight, and nine as one item. If there's a motion, move approval. Second. Is there any uh, questions or comments from the board? Any public comment on those three items? Okay, then you call the roll. Assemblymember Buchanan. Aye. Scott Harvey. Aye. Kathleen Moore. Aye. Lynn Green. Aye. Cynthia Bryant. Aye. Okay, then we'll move on to tab. I lost track of my tabs. Ten. Tab ten. Pittsburgh Unified. Ms. Barbara Catmanner is going to present this item, Madam Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon. The Pittsburgh Unified School District item is a district request to modify a previous board action due to a change in circumstances. Um, back in 2007, the board approved a facility hardship for this district to abandon the Central Junior High School site due to a natural gas pipeline running through the middle of it. The previous item, which is listed in your books on stamp page 173 as attachment A, on page 174, the district was required to sell 10.5 acres of the site, which was deemed unsafe, and remit 100% of the proceeds to the state. Another condition of the original item was that a parcel of the original site, which contained a gymnasium, it was 0.9 acres, that the district decide whether or not they wanted to sell that parcel or keep it. If they chose to keep it, they needed to have it appraised at the time the new replacement facilities were occupied and re remit the appraised value of that acreage to the state as well. The district has since occupied the new site and they have determined that they've had an appraisal done of the 10 and a half acres and it's come to their attention that in order to sell the site it would cost more than they would actually get for the property. So the site to sell it at its highest and best use would require that they knock down the buildings that are currently there, and those buildings contain asbestos, which they would have to clean up before they could get a buyer interested. The cost to do so would be more expensive than what they could ultimately get for the site. They have indicated that they would like to, instead of doing that, use the site for either district administration or for adult education purposes, both of which are non-K-12 purposes. Um, and that way they could use the existing facilities which would not then become blighted and then they would not be incurring costs to sell the land off. Um, staff has reviewed the district's request. We do believe that given the circumstances, it is reasonable um, with regards to putting the adults and the administration into that other section of the site. We don't feel that given the K-12 nature of the program that we have jurisdiction over what the district does with that piece. We, the board does have jurisdiction obviously with the K-12 parcel uh, or piece of it which they dealt with back in 2007. Um, however, at this point we would recommend that the district provide a board resolution stating that the site would not be utilized for K-12 school purposes. Um, acknowledge any funding of the state allocation board programs for the site is prohibited. We would recommend that they do continue with their original requirement of remitting the value of the gym parcel to the state because they have decided to keep it. And the value of that was appraised at $101,346. That appraisal was done in 2009, which was slightly after the original uh, replacement site was occupied. So there was a little bit of a change there. And also if the board or if the district does sell the site at a future date, they must remit the proceeds to the state. So we are supportive of the district's request given those conditions. And um, I believe there is somebody from the district here to speak to this item today, but we would also be happy to answer any questions. Um, I just wanted the record to reflect that um, Assemblywoman Fuller's joined us. So we ha do now have a quorum. So anyway, thank you. So Madam Chair, are we ending our subcommittee meeting and starting the board meeting. That's what I was trying to say, but you said it better than I. Okay, so um, we've ended our subcommittee meeting and we're now in our full board meeting. <laughs>
So did you have anything to add? Good evening, Madam Chair, board members. Uh, my name is Enrique Palacios, Associate Superintendent for Business Services for Pittsburgh Unified School District. We agree with the recommendation from OPSC. Uh, this is a recommendation that the district and OPSC staff have worked very diligently for the past six months to arrive to. We believe that uh, we have come to common ground as to how to resolve this matter. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions or comments from board members? I'd like to speak before a motion. Pardon? I'd like to speak before a motion. Or do we speak after? Usually you make a motion and speak with. Right. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> uh, I make a motion that we accept OPSCs. Uh, and the district's um, sounds like mutual consensus agreement to option one, allow the district to retain the site, but under certain conditions uh, so that uh, we're, ho we're held whole and harmless. Um, Is there a second? Thank you. Second. Did you, so do you want to speak on the motion now? No. I, yeah. I'm just basically option one. <laughs> All right. Um, I will be a no vote on the Pittsburgh request um, to be to be released from selling the former Central High School um, Central Junior High School for the following reasons. In 2007, the State Allocation Board agreed to abandon this school and replace it pursuant to the facility hardship regulations. The 2007 staff report indicated the following, and I quote. The district is concerned for the life safety of its approximately 1,000 pupils attending the Central Junior High School due to the presence of a 26-inch, 600 PSI natural gas pipeline that bisects the campus. The pipeline risk analysis report prepared by the district investigated possible mitigation measures but could not recommend these alternatives as they were inadequate to provide the necessary life safety protection. There was also a specialist report that was confirmed by the Department of Conservation and they concurred with the finding and considered the pipeline risk to be significant. The school district advises that in order to sell the buildings and the site, it will cost more to abate the asbestos and demolish that land um, more than that land is now worth. However, this was a negotiated deal with the state that included only a portion of the site and not its entirety. Um, perhaps the State Allocation Board should revisit the issue as well as investigate the ability to sell as is. The main reason provided for an approval recommendation of this is that a precedent was set for allowing the Santee to retain a school site that had been abandoned. I believe we should consider these requests on their own merit um, as they are exceptions to the regulations. To my knowledge, in the case of Santee, the school building was torn down and demolished by the school district. So that precedent is very different. I also understand that the site is being used by the city and not by the school district, and that the site did not have a high-pressure gas pipeline bisecting it. In the, in the interest of addressing the district's concerns that they cannot sell the site, perhaps the State Education Board should entertain the demolition of the existing buildings, thereby addressing the possible blight and safety issues that may occur with these buildings. To me, that's an idea worth exploring and that the ground maintenance of the area at that point would be simpler and less costly. And while some would postulate that because we are only approving non-school use, which can include by definition from the education code, administration, adult education, community day schools for expelled students, pregnant and parenting teens, warehouses, garage, it does not mean that we simply ignore known safety risks for these uses. These exclusions from the Ed Code are for purposes of Field Act, and this is not a Field Act issue. Further, we allow exemptions for non-conforming lease buildings, but we also require that the buildings were constructed in accordance, in accordance with seismic safety for commercial buildings. We simply do not ignore outright safety issues even with Field Act exemptions. For me, there is a reasonable factor concerning known safety risks that is being ignored. And even then, I'm not sure we would consider interpreting our own regulations to include such uses. We've never been in the position of a school district wanting to use for adult education and administration a site that has a high-pressure gas line that cannot be mitigated. Um, 
So for those reasons, I am the voting no. I would urge the, vo the, the board to vote no as well because a life is a life is a life. And if we have found that this um, site is uh, not usable for safety concerns, a major safety of a, of a pipeline that runs through it, um, I in good conscience could not vote that we would allow for adult education and administration. Having worked in administration, I wouldn't want to work in a building that I knew had a known safety, safety hazard that cannot, by our own reports, be mitigated. Ms. Buchanan. I have, I have some questions and some comments. What's going to happen to the current site where the administration is? Or is that going to be demolished? Is that going to be sold? What's going to happen to it? Um, the previous administration of the school district, let me just point out that in the past uh, couple of years, we had a series of changes in the executive level. Uh, when we presented our, our, our recommendations back in 2007, was to use the facility as administration uh, for administration services, uh, the current administration has decided that it will be a better use of the facility for adult education. So you're going to use the current administration for adult education? No, the current administration will remain where it is. So and we will use the you're going to use the central site for adult ed? For adult ed. Okay. And then you're going to, so you're going to re remodel it and use it for adult ed or use it as is? As is, pretty much. Okay, so I'm looking for a reason to be able to support this because I understand school districts, um, you know, have a need to, uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense to spend more money than the site's worth, but I share many of Ms. Moore's concerns. And when I read this application, I mean, there, there was a whole lot that's confusing to me, and maybe it's because I'm a new member of the State Allocations Board. But when you have the Department of Education say if an easement containing a pipeline with a maximal operating pressure at or above 800 PSI is within 1,500 feet of a proposed school site, an acceptable pipeline risk analysis must be prepared. And then the, um, the uh, findings were that it was an, uh, there was an unsafe transmission pipeline and, you know, that that occurred. It was a significant health and safety risk to students and staff. And then what we went ahead and approved um, the, uh, the critical hardship um, to relocate the students at the Range Row site, which where the same pipeline runs, and it says that it's on page 174, says that it's 257 feet from the edge of the nearest building. So how was the, I mean, going back historically, if you need to have a, a, a buffer zone of 1,500 feet, was an analysis done to show that the 257 feet was presented a safe zone? I, I cannot respond to that, ma'am. I was not present at the district when that happened. Okay. Um, however, the district has been working with OPSC to resolve this matter, and if there is any other alternative to resolve this matter, we'll be happy to entertain that. The reality is that this site is unoccupied, it is blighted, and the district cannot afford to maintain a property that we are not going to use and it will be a disservice to the Pittsburgh community to leave a completely vacant, blighted building. And I think we all agree with that. And Ms. Moore's question is, is if, if the findings are that it represents a substantial risk to students or staff, why is it okay to have adult students, a student in there that's 18, but not a student who's that's 17 or 16 or 15? And, um, and I know that the technical answer is is because the law allows it, but I, I think there's there there there's there is that that safety issue. So I guess what what I'm wondering is is there some way as part of this motion we can have um, some kind of assurance that this site is safe for uh, to be occupied um, by, um, you know, there is no risk to, to uh, the staff or those who are going to occupy the building. Well, is that? I mean, yeah. is, is there some I mean, way they, of, doing, they, of they, having they, an engineer or someone come in and do an analysis so that we know that it's... Um, well, here, 
Madam Chair. Um, the other rea reality of Pittsburgh, that Pittsburgh has about 80, 80 utility lines going under the city. Perhaps one third of the housing and commercial development runs along the side of this pipe. And there are 79 other fuel pipes through Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a distribution center mm -hmm. for utilities for the entire Bay Area. So are we then going to relocate area school? Here, here's how I, I see it, I, though. I, I, the, if we knew that other schools had it bisecting right down the middle of the school site, I think that we would, and, and I'm sure the Pittsburgh board would be considering that very seriously, that that was considered here as well. Um, and the other sites that it, the, as you say, it is, um, there are a number of pipelines. So every project has to have, if it's within 500 or 1,500 feet, it is having a pipeline risk analysis. Oftentimes, there are ways that it can be mitigated, a berm wall, um, you know, different, different pieces, locating the buildings differently on the site. In the case of the one that we abandoned and agreed to abandon, I think it's within about 50 feet of the high-pressure gas pipe, um, pipeline. And um, there is a current, there's a current um, uh, analysis for use on the southern part of the site. And how pipeline risk analysis are done is they um, look at the it, how, how it, there's a threshold that can be passed. So, for instance, um, the 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 possibility of that pipeline bursting is is about a, a million and one possibility. However, if it bursts, the death toll um, within zone one is 19 people. The death toll in zone two is seven people, and the death toll in zone three is one person. So as in all kinds of risk analysis, you, ex you decide where, where your acceptable risk is. Um, I believe that in this case, we decided it was not an acceptable risk and that we would indeed relocate the school um, because it is so close. Now there's pieces of this school. There's, there's the larger building and then there's a couple of other buildings further back from the, from the pipeline. Um, I don't think there was ever an analysis that said, what about those buildings further back? Could we, is there a way that you could actually mitigate for those buildings? I don't, I don't believe that question was ever asked. I think we really looked at the, the primary building and, and said, it's, it's not mitigatable. Um, we can't, there's nothing that can be done. Now, could you revisit that with another report and say, you know, okay, if we really did want to mitigate it, is, it, is there any possibility of mitigation? You could probably ask that question. But we made the conscious decision in 2007 to say it, was, it wasn't mitigatable. Um, and so we're going to relocate these students. And I, I really understand the, the issue of blighting of a, of a vacant building. It's, it's not a good situation to have in anybody's inventory. Um, in the case of Santee, that we did allow them to utilize their site, they demolished the building. They got rid of it. It was the issue, and at their own expense, frankly. I think they came, I think they, the minute they knew there was a hazard, they, they exited the building, like I think, I believe Pittsburgh did. And then um, they ultimately, because of its blighting nature, um, it's, and it's a track, it's a nuisance, um, they paid their own costs to, to demolish it. Um, and so it's just a vacant, it's a vacant field. Um, so I, I, that's, that, that's why, you know, if you want to say, do we have jurisdiction? I actually think it's a little gray. Where, where they, uh, and I'm not an attorney, but where they say that, um, that those types of uses are exempt, it's under the Field Act that they're exempt, and they're exempt from seismic safety. It doesn't say they're exempt from all kinds of other, um, perhaps, safety issues. Um, I think those have been left unsaid, and that's why I say a reasonable person would say, why would we, why would we say it's not good enough for, um, you know, six to eight, 17 year olds, but it's okay to put our staff and to put 18 year olds in? I just, I, I can't vote for that. Any other? Ms. Fuller? Um, the question that comes to mind is, um, 
I'm a little cons- I'm a little confused over the jurisdiction of the SAB on this. Um, the CDE um, <clears throat> has a responsibility to oversee um, student safety programs and to review the quality of uh, the program in the buildings. Is, if I understand it right, I'm a little unclear. Someone kind of asking for like a opinion on this and. Our SAB's um, jurisdiction is that we give out money, bond money, and if we gave it out and we shouldn't have, we get it back. That's pretty much like our decision. And so, in my mind, um, the first situation is: is um, are they using the bond money in accordance with the bond? Um, Rules and regulations, or not, and if not, then they got to pay it back. Okay, in this case, it sounds like they agree that whether they keep it or lose it, they're going to have to pay it back at some point, and and that's our business tonight, and we need to make sure that 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 happens. Beyond that, <clears throat> the sort of ability to force a local school board to sell or not to sell, to condemn or not to condemn to determine that the program should be, you know, not for older students but for younger students or vice versa, that's a jurisdiction more, in my mind, of the CDE or somebody else. So, you know, like on my motion, my motion is just uh, in term, not in terms of safety, but my motion just is what are we doing about the bond money? In this case, clearly, we've got to get the bond money back one way or another sooner or later and... <clears throat> And it's just whether we ask for the money now or later. Like, I don't think we really have the authority to say they can retain it or not retain it. We just have to say, you have to sell it now because we want the money now or do whatever you're going to do, you know, later. Can you help me with that? To be clear, I I can't really comment on the uh, jurisdiction of, of the Department of Education. But as far as the SAB, uh, my understanding of the jurisdiction of the board is over facilities for kindergarten through 12th grade. And that's what staff is, is addressing as far as uh, there's not going to be any uh, use of education of kindergarten through 12th grade in any of these facilities. And, and that's what we're addressing specifically here. As far as, uh, I'm sorry, your other question about the... Uh, so my question is, like, one, okay, we have to make a ruling of whether they give the money back or not. We did that. And then, two, how soon do they have to give it back? <laughs> uh, our, the original, the original uh, decision by the board was to have the district sell this property and, and remit back the, the proceeds from that sale. Uh, so at this point, we could, one decision is not to make any decision and, and, and stand by the original uh, the original decision by the board that they sell it. Regulations require that if they sell it, they remit back. But the regulations don't specifically require them to sell the property. D- does that answer your question as far as our authority? So was the board within its right to originally tell them they had to sell it? If this because was part, why? If, if this was part of the agreement with the district on how we were going to arrange uh, that grant, uh, I believe that the board more than likely was have, not having studied this to be to be clear, but I, I believe the board was on solid footing to make an arrangement with the district to do that. Uh, if the district was unwilling at that time, we we could have come with, with another arrangement as far as the uh, uh, as far as the allocation. Assemblywoman Fuller, just to clarify um, another issue on on top of what um, legal counsel has stated. Um, as you can see in the agenda item from 2007, one of the requirements of the deal was that the land was to be sold and remitted back to the state. If the board, in considering this item, is concerned about bond money and that was part of the deal, um, the board can ask the district or um, see if that they would be willing to assess the value of the land as is. If they are now going to stay on the land, if, if the board so 
approves that direction, one of the stipulations, along with assessing the value of the gym, could be to assess the value of the land as is and request a remittance of the land value back to um, the state allocation board because that is um, kind of looking at it the flip of instead of selling it, you're saying it, appraise it as the as is value and remit that um, back to the state because that was the deal that was um, done in 2007, if the board so chooses. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I just a um, clarification. We did we did only we we partioned partioned off that site, correct? That that site is larger than the site that um, portion that the district was required to sell. Right. They were not required to sell the whole site, only ten and a half acres. Ten and a half acres. Okay. Ms. Brownlee? Sorry that I've 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 missed a lot of the discussion um, on this particular item. And um, but hearing the tail end of it, I just had a question, and that is um, on the property itself, is there um, a way in which uh, the district, I, I heard, I guess there was a lot of conversation about the risk involved in terms of um, something catastrophic happening on this uh, particular property. So I'm wondering if, if there is a way in which to not mitigate um, uh, do an entire cleanup, but to ensure that the 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 pipes that are <laughs> underground are safe and um, you know uh, uh, safe up to the point of some some catastrophic thing that will happen that could you know put anybody in danger anywhere, anyhow. And so I'm just wondering if that had been um, addressed or looked upon, and then under those circumstances, that would certainly reduce the risk. Uh, in, in terms of allowing the property b to be utilized for a different use. Camp Miner, did you want to respond to that? Um, yes. Um, in the original item on stamp page 174, the first paragraph, our concern with that would be that the pipeline risk analysis report uh, investigated possible mitigation measures, but they, at that time they could not recommend the alternatives as they were inadequate to provide the necessary life safety protection. So we're not... At the staff level, we're not certain that that is actually an option. I don't know if the district has done any further studies to see if additional measures could happen, but the original study did not indicate that that would be a viable option. Any other, other Mr. Harvey? 118 to 170. As a follow-up, it, 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 it seems to be a matter of proximity because the second paragraph of that same report on page 174 talks about an additional site, and I think we alluded to it, uh, some of Member Buchanan did, uh, 257 feet seemed to be okay uh, because you could mitigate any health and safety threat posed by the pipeline. So in that case, it was okay. The issue here is it's bisecting the site and obviously is closer than 257 feet by some magnitude. And as you say, in paragraph one on page 174, the the uh, study said you really could not mitigate it. And there was an independent review that said the same. The, the issue, though, does, I think, hinge on jurisdiction. You know, to put it not flipply, but are we the pipeline police here? I mean, do, do, do we have jurisdiction to make a, a finding on the appropriateness of a pipeline? Um, it's... It's ironic and, and um, perhaps unfortunate. Um, in the third paragraph on page 174 said that the Department of Education pipeline setback requirements are not applicable to these non-school facilities. So again, if you're not doing a K-12, to it doesn't look like we necessarily have a way of saying no. And that may not be good public policy, but I'm wondering if, if we do have the right to say no in this case. Well, we, we did say no in 2007. But was it a proper no? <laughs> I don't, I'm just, I'm yeah, rhetorically it's, asking it's the question. I wasn't here in 07, but the more I'm reading this, it, it, it doesn't look like we as a board have a clean way of, of addressing a pipeline. Ms. Buchanan. I, see, this is my problem. I don't think we have a clean way 
And it certainly doesn't make sense to me to have a district pay more to demolish a site than it's worth. Okay, so whether you would help them in terms of doing that, um, you know. I will tell you, so from that point of view, you know, I'm prepared to accept staff's recommendation. I will tell you, though, that it doesn't feel good to me to, to do that knowing that we're going to put 18-year-old students there and this risk still remains. So I agree with Assemblyman Member Fuller. I mean, that's out of our jurisdiction. I would hope that the district, though, when it makes this decision, would do the proper due diligence because you've got a whole record here that says everyone knows what the, what the risks are at this site and, and, and if you go ahead and you have adult students there and this pipeline bursts, I mean, I would think there would be significant liability. Yeah. And that's, so, I mean, and so I don't, so I would hope that, that, you know, if you move forward with this, um, that you would take a look at whether or not you could, I don't know whether you can build a, some kind of wall or there's any kind of mitigation you could do, but clearly this analysis says that you know, if you do this, that those students will be at risk. And we may not have any authority over it. CDE doesn't approve, you know, um, uh, uh, sites for, um, you know, adult continuing education. But clearly there's an analysis here that says they're at risk. And I do agree that's outside of our jurisdiction, but it just, you know, we're, we're dealing with a legal issue. And then I think we're dealing with, you know, what some of us would consider to be a, a moral issue. Yeah, I completely concur with that. And I would say that I don't want to sit here just thinking about what the decision is, is what we're talking about, safety of these adult education students. You know, we're, we'd be substituting our judgment for the judgment of the Pittsburgh Unified School District Board of Trustees, and they're the ones that need to make this decision. I mean, it would if something happened to the 197 and 1, it would be very difficult, and I would feel horrible about it. I would just say to you that, are you sure this is what you want to do with the property? Um, I think that the staff has done a great job coming up with a compromise that does what we're supposed to do, which is protect the bond funds and makes a reasonable accommodation to the district in terms of their fiscal condition. But I just, are you sure you want to do this? I'd ask your, I just would ask you that. Well, um, <laughs> that's why we're here. That's why we made the appeal. Um, but I, I, I I hear you, Ms. Buchanan, and uh, we will look at mitigation options uh, to see how we can deal with that uh, risk that we have there. Because it's really on the record now. Did you want to add something? I'm sorry. <laughs> As the non-legislative member of the board, um, it would make, yes, it would make sense if this is law that says that there is a difference between a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old, then maybe the law should be revisited. And to punish a school district or to say to a school district that they're responsible for this, they may be because they made the decision, but in actuality, this is a legislative issue if you want it changed. I agree that the legislature should address this, but um, it, the school district ultimately is the one that if something happens, knowing this, they do have responsibility. Is there any public, additional public comment on this item? I call for the question. Can you call the roll? What, what is the motion? Oh. <laughs> Having come in in the middle of this Sorry. fine discussion. <laughs> it's, um, the, motion, the motion by Ms. Fuller was, op was <laughs> yeah, option one, the staff recommendation. Uh, Senator Huff. Aye. <laughs> Assembly Member Fuller. A very reluctant aye, but aye. Uh, Assembly Member Brownlee. Aye. Assembly Member Buchanan. Another reluctant aye. Scott Harvey. A very sad aye. <laughs> Kathleen Moore. No. Lynn Green. Aye. Cynthia Bryant. Aye. It carries. I'll leave aye. it open. Thank you. All right, um, Senator Huff, let me ask just members, how long do we have members here? Uh, okay, let's go through, let's, let's lift our um, calls on the items that we have open and see how far we can get before we lose our brief quorum.
We're just going to, Senator Hancock, we're just going to lift the call on, on it. Do you want a minute before we do that? On the things we've taken up so far, which is consent, the minutes, and we just did the Pittsburgh item. It consent specials. Okay, no, I know. I don't know what the motion was on Pittsburgh. So it's it was the staff recommendation. It's the staff recommendation. But you're going to go through the items and then yeah. say what the recommendation is. Right. right. Okay. <coughs> okay, uh, first up is uh, tab number two, which is the minutes to approve. Uh, Senator Hancock. Uh, Senator Huff? Aye. Assemblymember Fuller? Aye. Assemblymember Brownling? Aye. Uh, next up is tab number four, the consent agenda, but removing pages 144 and 145, Orange County and Victor Valley? No, no. Victor Valley oh. is on. Oh, pardon me. Yes. Just striking orange, orange COE. Uh, Senator Hancock? Give me a moment. Okay, that's okay. Okay. Um, Senator Huff? Assemblymember Fuller? Aye. Assemblymember Brownlee? Aye. It carries, but I can keep it open until they're ready. Okay. Senator Hancock added on aye. Okay, thank you. And Senator Lowenthal? Consent calendar, Senator. She said he was free. This is a consent calendar? Yes. 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 Next is Kim. Uh, Senator Lowenthal, um, to approve the uh, minutes from the last board. Tab two. Tab two. Aye. Am I going to go through all of them that I missed? Those were the only two you've missed so far. We're, you're caught up. You're caught you're up, and we have a couple more. I'm <laughs> caught up. That's all we've done this yeah. time, too. Tab two. Mm -hmm. so we're we're, we're <laughs> coming back. going back through. Got it. Okay. N next up is the consent specials, tabs seven, eight, and nine. Uh, Senator Lowenthal. Aye. Senator Hancock. Aye. Senator Huff. Aye. Assemblymember Fuller. Aye. Assemblymember Brownlee. Aye. Carries. And last off was the uh, Pittsburgh Unified to approve staff option number one. Senator Lowenthal? No. Uh, Senator Hancock? Abstain. Abstain. I'm sorry, the motion still carries. Okay, so now I've lost my place. So we're on tab. Tab 11 has been pulled, um, which I'd like to just take a second to remind everybody that we do provide in the binders every week a workload. Um, so there really is an opportunity to know that your item's ready to go up. And because I knew we didn't have enough time, I entertained the, that, but I'm kind of over it. <laughs> uh, tab 12, uh, I'm not sure who asked tab 12. So we wanted to share with the board is uh, we had last month a discussion about the recommendations of reconciling all the bond funds or the cash that we have available. And so the purpose of this report is to share with the board the cash proceeds that are available um, that we can turn into active apportionments. So again, at our last meeting, we requested, uh, you requested that staff do reconciliation of those funds. And so staff have reconciled all the cash funds within each of the bond funds. Um, and with that, all the cash that we have available, $68.5 million, um, with the exception of the $208,000 for Proposition 1D as a result of the remaining bond funds from the March 2010 sale and the priority of funding round, um, the cash has, been, has come through the program as a result of rescissions and closeouts. So the current law authorizes the board to transfer available lease purchase program funds to an, any active program within the school facility program. And at this time, we have $7 million to share um, 
and that's available to transfer um, to any of the ACTOR programs. So if you see, there's a chart on page two. Draw your attention to that. Um, excuse me. On page 206, we wanted to highlight, um, again, there's $7 million available from lease purchase program. And then within the other propositions, 1A, 47, 55, and 1D, there is accumulation of $61.4 million available for transfer. But this, this funds, excuse me, that's not available for transfer. It's actually available to use to provide apportionments within the bond funds. So we have active unfunded approvals that cash could be applied to. So with that, we're sharing with the board a few options. Um, the option that we have for option one is to convert unfunded approvals to apportionments within the original bond fund provide advanced fund release for design and, and site acquisition for charter school facilities program, or provide fund releases for separate site apportionments on environmental hardship under the critically overcrowded school program. And another option we're laying out in option two is create another priority funding round. So, and we laid out each of the options has um, some challenges as far as um, whether or not the cash could be dispersed and the cash could be dispersed for the for this program uses however it could be delayed and when those cash could be accessed because they districts will have potentially up to 18 months to access the cash um, if you provide the funding in the uh, date order situation um, if you opt out and opt for option two um, available for a future funding round in priorities Again, we can bring that cash back when we have additional closeout and rescissions to create another priorities and funding round. And option two, again, we can direct staff to utilize the cash on hand to provide advanced fund releases for Proposition 55 and or Proposition 1D preliminary apportionments for charter school facility program. And option four is to direct staff to use those bond for seeds for separate site apportionments and environmental hardships. The board should know that option one, the school district will have, again, 18 months to request those funds, and the board should also know in options three and four, the districts do not have a time requirement or time restraints to submit a fund release request. So those funds could be remaining there idly indefinitely. And at this time, staff is requesting direction on how to use available bond seeds. Proceed, so I'll open it for questions. Okay, um, I'd just like to comment really quickly about this item. I, I meant to actually talk a little bit about it. We talked briefly about this at our last meeting, but I, I think I failed to really dis describe kind of what I'd been thinking about this along the way and why it's on the agenda the way it is. And that is, is that we in the, in the past, we've been somewhat slow um, on these rescissions and on money that's coming back into our system to then churn it back out into the program. Sometimes several months will go by and then we'll wait till we've accumulated a chunk and then we bring it an apportionment in to the board. Um, I think we did one in February or March with some of the cash. Um, but because we've, we're in the situation now where there's unmet need for cash and, and because we had the successful priorities and funding round, and again, I keep having the goal of trying to make sure that our program has limited amount of cash sitting around so that, that the treasurer um, is in, and the church, director of the Department of Finance and are inclined to sell bonds for our program. So I asked staff to give us the whole picture so that we could decide what we wanted to do. And I also asked staff, which I failed to talk about at the last meeting, to, was to bring back what's in tab 13, a generic priorities and funding regulatory package so that to put in our regulations a tool that if we decide when there's a future bond sale, or if we have a situation like this where there's a large amount of cash in a rescission, um, in a rescission position that we could then, as a board, decide that we're going to do a round of priorities and funding, just like we did before, but it would be a, a more of a generic one. So I think what I was hoping to accomplish in this item is just having a sense from members of where they thought we should apply newly available cash in each of these bond funds. So I think. That's, again, that was a purpose. And the goal is to report out quarterly. So again, there isn't cash laying around. We want to activate that cash so we can provide apportionments to projects sitting on the unfunded list. So with that, if there are any other comments or thoughts or questions from board members on this item. Ms. Brownlee? Yeah, just um, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, just in terms of looking at the item and some of the recommendations, um, it seems as though there's um, 
the recommendations seem to hover around charter school facilities or environmental hardships, but you know, then what about a joint use agreements or CTE programs or the relocatable program? I mean, it, it seems I'm not sure how we got to sort of a, a more narrow focus in you know the rationale sort of behind that. So. Michael Watanabe, OPS team. The, the reason why we highlighted these these particular four options is that these are options that will maintain the integrity of the unfunded list as it is without skipping people in line. Now, with these options, it's important that, to note this item is talking about cash, and we're not talking about bonding authority. Charter school facility programs and these COS projects have preliminary apportionments and they are not on the unfunded list. These projects have up to five years to convert to a final apportionment in which time they would pop onto the unfunded list. As part of these preliminary apportionments, these projects qualified for advanced site and design. Sorry, I missed Sorry. Last. As part of the preliminary apportionments, one of the things the district has options to do is receive an advanced funding release for site and design to get their project moving forward <coughs> so they can convert to a final apportionment. Currently, we don't have cash to give them that money to get moving to move forward to their final apportionment. So these are options without skipping anybody in line to let those projects move forward, albeit a very small amount. In terms of joint use, we are out of bonding authority. There is one project on the unfunded list that could potentially receive cash if we were to start moving down the line. But in terms of saving this cash for the projects we talked about last month, if you recall, we had four projects they are not on the unfunded list because we are out of bonding authority. We wouldn't want to save that cash for those projects because when we reserve it for them, we'd be skipping the entire unfunded list. What we can do, and we, we intend to bring this back as a future item, when we move the LPP money up to one of the other pop LPP? Oh, sorry. The uh, $7 million in the lease mm -hmm. purchase program, it's an inactive program. When we move that cash to the other propositions for whichever the option the board chooses, we will then have to move the seven million in bonding authority tied to that. And with that discussion, a future discussion, we can choose who we want to go to, in which case joint use would be an option. And any of these options the district chooses, joint use will not be left out as an option because joint use is a program in 4755 and 1D. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with all the other programs. So it's the unfunded list that's driven the, these recommendations. I mean, you're sort of backed into it, right? I mean, based on the unfunded that, that's in the unfunded say, list, yeah. and so then the on the unfunded list too. I mean, there. Uh, I guess we're going to look at this maybe later, but there are you know these projects um, where you know there's ten projects sort of uh, maybe I'm talking about something else. All sort of on the same date. Is that yeah. you know yeah. right? There's yeah. that potential. Yes. Okay. Yeah. In and intent in the item 14, we're going to talk a little bit about that, that phenomenon. Right. But just relative to backing into the unfunded okay. list by, you know, virtue of these categories, recognizing that some are charter schools and uh, CTE programs, et cetera, right? That's what you've done. Kind of. Kind of. Kind, kind of. of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, the charters, these, these charter projects and these environmental hardships are not on the unfunded list in terms of cash proceeds available for them to come in for these advanced funding release. These environmental hardships, mm -hmm. um, I believe all these projects have actually converted to final and are sitting on, unfunded, on the unfunded list somewhere in order and could eventually receive full project funding, but in the absence of that, they can't move forward at all until they get their advanced mm -hmm. Hazardous waste. And did you uh, look at any other uh, methods and eliminated them because they sounded unsound? Uh, I don't think we eliminated any options. No, and it's available for any program within the school facility program. Again, the op one of the options is is to park it in the school facility program, so you wouldn't be eliminating anybody. Okay. Any other questions? I, I have a question for Ms. Brownlee. Did you understand that, and could you say it then in a few sentences so I could understand it? <laughs> I'm sorry, folks, but I have been in government for many, many years, and this is one of the first times I'm in a place where I honestly, it's hard to do 
subject for uh, come up with something that tells me what our choices are. If if, if you did, because I know you're more into school finance than I am, no, please. I mean, I, my understanding, although the last comment that was made made me wonder whether I did understand it or not, but I thought what I understood was that they looked at the unfunded list of projects, yeah. and there's this bucket of money, $68.5 million, and they recommended um, that that money go into certain buckets of pro programs because those programs would then address the next projects on the unfunded list. Right, so the $7 million would be added to the $61 million for eight million, like you said, mm -hmm. yes, um, but these can't be transferred to other bond funds. But what but they're they recomm can, recommending is... But they can be apportioned. Right. They, but, well, this, this, would, this would be cash that's applied to already apportioned projects. Is that right? Unfunded approval projects. Unfunded, yeah. right, right, unfunded approvals, right. and then they would be converted into apportionments. Correct. Right. So it means we're just going to fund the next round of things in those bond categories. Right. That right. is the one option. That's option one. And they're just, and this is what, when I f followed up with the question, so there are <clears throat> charter schools on that list, right. must be high up on the list. There, in, there are schools with environmental hardships high up on the list, but not necessarily joint use projects and or CTE projects because you're not transferring money to those. All the all the CT projects that have cash apportioned to them. Now we have a new cycle coming in. Those would be needed to add it onto the unfunded list, but they have bonding authority to do that. I think. Right. Right. So, but they do not need cash at this point. All the ones that have active apportionments have cash. That's kind of back on the status of funds that 1.3 billion in cash outstanding that encompasses a lot of CT projects or all the CT projects that are outstanding. But yes, there are some charter projects that have converted to final apportionments and are actually on the unfunded list. There are also charter projects that are in that inactive. They have just, just their preliminary apportionments and have not converted over. But in that preliminary stage, they still qualify for fund releases just okay. for the site and design. So when you're talking about cash, you know, it, it's because they're high on the list, they're ready to go, they need the matching funds, and they need cash now to to move forward to, to, to move forward yeah. okay and you're saying for other projects they have the bonding authority but they're not so they're not it's not a shovel ready project at the moment and so there's a way in which to finance those projects down the road, the road. when they are shovel ready correct okay yeah and i and guess my question would be is there a way to prioritize again shovel ready in whatever category, I mean, because I don't. Option two could accomplish that, accomplish that in parallel with the other item. But it's we don't have a mechanism later in date. place. Correct. We don't have a mechanism in place to create another priority round right now. Well, would that mean that proceeds could remain unexpended for up to eighteen months, mm -hmm. as it says in pro in option one? It, the, if we go with option two and the priority funding round is not created, it just sits in our accounts. No, no. But what if we do? It says here regulations need to be approved to do option two. If you would go that, with that, how many months or whatever would that take? And in other words, how do we end up with money on the street? Sure. Right. I mean, I, we can do it on, and tab 13 is, would be addressing that item. And as Cynthia shared earlier, is we'll be the opportunity to extend those regulations that we have currently for the priorities of funding round. And like in the spirit of what we did for the last regulations that created priorities of funding, we would accelerate that just as well. And the goal would obviously come back within 30 days to have those regulations adopted. So it wouldn't be sitting out there. I think, I mean, the real, to me, that just if I can, what I think the fundamental question in front of us with this cash line around is, is do we want what we did in, I can't remember, was it March? March, April, whatever, one month, February or March, we had 50 million, something like that. And what we did is we apportioned on, off, onto the unfunded list the top, you know, say it was 10 projects. And so we just went down the order. So we now have this 
this is the same situation we were in then. And then we decided we went with option one because we hadn't gotten into this concept of shovel ready. We hadn't gotten into the concept of priorities and funding yet. So to me, the fundamental question is, do we want to go ahead and have them, the staff work up an item next month that would just apportion down the list so we can get the cat, you know, get going, but it would be our regular old process of sitting around for 18 months? Or do we want to hold the cash aside until we have a new priorities and funding round? Or do you want staff to work up other options to try to reach other cash-starved <coughs> projects or people in the program? That's, that's basically I can tell you what I'd like. <laughs> I'd like to get the money, I agree with Senator Hancock, the money out on the street as soon as possible. And if I'm hearing all of this correctly, the idea is, is we don't create a new funding, a, we don't change the, uh, the order in which districts are on these lists, but our goal is to get the money out there to take more districts off the top of the list. And if I'm hearing you correctly, the way to accomplish that is to um, – uh, authorize a new priority funding round or extend it, which could be done, I don't know, at the next meeting. And, and at the same time, can we at the same meeting make the uh, apportion a those funds so we're actually getting work done? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that would be what I would, that would be the direction it, I'd like to take. It, and it goes, it goes okay. hand in hand with tab 13. Okay. So do we need a motion for that? This is, so is an action Kathleen. item or information item. Good. Yeah, just if staff could explain to me a little bit about option three. It, this is charter school funding program. What, what is the significance of um, if we move money into here for having advanced fund releases for design and site acquisition? It, Once these projects have cash for site and design, they can move forward with their projects to convert to a final apportionment where they can move on to the unfunded list and eventually receive funding for their entire project but without that advanced cash for their design and site, they're there to sit standstill. Okay, so they, it helps them get up in the queue or get the, the initial design money to, to make right, that happen. Right, so they can get onto the list. In the, we seem to be short-circuiting a lot of the charter school funding. I would hope our final recommendation would be proving some of the money on option three and then some more on what the rest of you are talking about, like option one. Can I just ask a question there? Is there any difference there whether you're a charter or a non-charter school in terms of the schools that need the design money? The, the way this, the, the charter program works is a little different than the typical program. The charter program allows districts to receive charter schools a preliminary apportionment, which basically they tell the board that they intend to build a certain project. Then they receive what we term as a set-aside, a reservation of funds, if you will. Then they also have the ability to come in and request advanced release of funds for design or site. Um, and that's to get them to submit the plans to the Division of the State Architect, Department of Education, and then come in and submit a full application within a five-year period. That is unique to the program. Um, under the regular school facility program, the only other districts that have that same opportunity are financial hardship districts. They can come in and access design or site money as well. The other thing that I want to highlight, too, for the charter program, they have a loan component. Most of them came in and requested a loan, so they are receiving 100 percent financing from the state, but they're paying back their loan when they receive the funding. So aside from financial hardship districts and charter projects, all other projects have to come in with the full funding application, which means that they have to go out and get the plan approvals first. So a charter district now could enter into a loan agreement right now and pay it back when they got funding? Yeah. yeah so, they, they, so they have a mechanism. So in terms well, they, of... They need the cash, though. They do need the cash. Right, but they could borrow. What you're saying is they have the ability to borrow. They borrow from the state. The state right. pays for okay. their local match, yeah. So, you know... But what about the preliminary designs? That's what he's saying. They borrow for that and then they pay it back. I mean, I... On the one hand, I have sympathy, but on the other hand, 12.4% unemployment... We need to get people back to work, and, and it shouldn't be in projects that, where you've got five years to completion. It should be projects, I think, that are ready to bid. Did you want to go? No. Yes, I have a question. Um, at our last board meeting, we talked about there was $5 million in um, joint use projects that you said was going to wait until this agenda item. And, this, and could you explain to me 
if I wanted to advocate for um, joint use projects, how, how is it kind of the chicken or the egg? Because they're not they're not on the list yet, but they can't get on the list because there's no cash, right? Mm -hmm. So right. how how can we help joint use projects? If if the board had buying authority at the last meeting, they would have received an unfunded approval, and they would have been placed on the unfunded list. Okay. Then, as cash became available, they would have received funding, depending on whether or not on the list. If the board were to provide cash for those projects now, they would basically essentially move up to the top of the list and receive cash ahead of all the other projects that are in, on the unfunded list. But we still have the issue of the bonding authority. Um, we initially tried to include the bonding authority issue as part of this item. But frankly, it's another very complicated issue to talk about bonding authority when you're talking about cash. So we wanted to try and isolate. This is the cash that we have available, and what can we use with the cash? So and then we're going to bring back a separate item to talk about uh, additional bonding authority that may be available. So some of this cash, one of this, some of this cash, is it, is it, could it be applied to create additional authority for joint use? Yes. yes. Which part is that? That's the 7.06. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need to. So okay, you you can move that cash into one A. Oh, actually, one A wouldn't really be an option. Yep, you can move the uh, the seven point zero six to forty seven fifty five one D. Park the cash in one of those propositions until the priority round is created, and at the same time that you move the cash, you can create the joint use bonding authority now, and just leave the cash sitting in one of those accounts. Okay, so that's an option that we have to. That's an option. I think we have some fans of joint use here, and I think that's an option as we develop to come back. We need to make sure we have that joint use piece in front of the, of the board. Remembering my briefing now. Senator Lowenthal? Yeah, do we, I, I like the idea of following up with, I think, Senator Hancock and, Sen and Assembly Member Buchanan of projects that are ready to bid, the concept of ready to bid. Do we have an idea about how many projects are ready to bid? Um, not on the unfunded list, but we, but we, this is part of the tab 13. Um, we're going to get into the, the, um, well, the projects that we're able to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. sorry to interrupt. Well, we had an overwhelming, um, uh, overwhelming participation in the priorities of funding round. I mean, we had $1.3 billion in requests. So technically we do know that there are projects that are ready to bid. We you know, know there's about 900 million. Exactly. So ready I mean, to go. right. I mean, those are the ones who didn't get access to the cash because there was only a limited amount of money. So technically, yes, we do know there are projects out there that are ready to bid. Okay. We have public comment. <coughs> Dave Walrath, representing California Charter School Association, and it's to address the charter school issue that was raised. Under a hardship apportionment, which is also 100% funding, state funding, the district has an unfunded approval for their apportionment and then goes on the list. And when you do your priority, they go through the list if they make their commitments on what they'll be doing within the priority program. A charter project doesn't have that. What they have instead is a preliminary apportionment and cannot get onto the unfunded unless they do a series of actions. The loan has no money. There's no money for the loan. This is a cash issue which allows the creation of money to make the design in sight so they can then move on to the apportionment process in the same way as a hardship district. Almost all these charters have no money. They are essentially the same as a hardship, but by the nature of the charter program, they have a different series of hoops they have to go through and a different process. What I believe I understand from the staff comment under option three is you're just trying to make the charter school facility program in these cash starved times more equal playing field as a hardship district is within the regular school facility program. 
I just wanted to ask a question really without prejudice to charter schools at all. But what you're saying then is for the charter schools, in essence, you know, this cash would go, would, wouldn't go for hard hats because it's not a shovel-ready project. It would go for the architect and the planning and so forth to kind of get it, you know, get it to that stage, right? But then once it got there, it would be, there would be time before it got to be sort of a, you know, going out to bid or, you know, shovel ready, however we want to describe it. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So, I mean, so if we're talking about getting projects out the door right away, and again, this is not without prejudice to charter schools for a minute. I'm just trying to understand it. So if we were going to move, you know, all the projects out the door as quickly as we possibly could, this wouldn't be the best option. As a question, I would say that if you want to start moving projects forward, if you don't do this, these projects won't go forward. No, I understand. I understand. But there are other uh, – again, I understand the uniqueness of the charter school situation. Well, I understand. It's yeah. common of without prejudice, but the result is prejudice. I, I, I get that, too, and I agree with you. And so I'm just trying to understand it. So thank you. Next. <laughs> I'm Steve Castellanos. I'm a program executive with Caldwell Floors and Winters, and uh, um, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Ms. Moore for her comments on joint use, so just to make sure that joint use isn't left out in this round. You're right. You know, joint use is, is just as, you know, uh, uh, we the, the former speaker spoke about uh, charter schools. It's a different line, you know. But it is about partnership, and in many of these projects, the five million projects that are already out there, uh, there are partners out there waiting for the state's portion of the money to proceed. And so, you know, whether or not they're shovel, shovel ready, how fast they can get to uh, they get to construction, all these communities are, are know about the problem of uh, unemployment in the state, and all of them are looking for construction jobs. Uh, and so, I think you know there is some urgency with regard to joint schools. The other thing about joint schools, and I'm urging your support, of course, to include joint schools in your final decision, is that um, we just get a bigger bang for our buck. You know, I mean, uh, if we're talking about putting as much money on the street as possible, uh, we can do even more with the types of partner ships that joint use and genders and, and get the added plus of uh, hopefully serving kids better, uh, creating more successful schools and school programs, and healthier communities. And so I'd urge your support to include joint use in your considerations. And, and a follow-up question of staff. I, I'm not remembering the program correctly. The five million that came, that is on, that came in during that funding round, are they, what stage of of the process are they are are they through DSA do they are they going to DSA so they're through DSA yes. so they're quote unquote shovel ready as well okay ready willing and eager <laughs> okay next okay Good afternoon. I'm Janet Klegel. I'm the superintendent of Lindsay Unified School District. Um, Madam Chairperson and members of the board, I'm here advocating for the joint use projects. I have two of those projects on that list. They are indeed shovel ready. We're ready to go. They're in partnership with our city. Um, we're in the central San Joaquin Valley, and the facilities our children have that promote their growth come primarily from the school district and from the community. And if this gym were to be built and this library were to be built, it would do some really great things for the children of our school district. Also, as the previous speaker said, they are really cost effective. And we will use those facilities from early in the morning until the evening time, as they will be open to members of the community. So for a poor far farm working rural community, these projects could make a big difference and they really would put people in Tulare County to work. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, members, Tom Duffy for the Coalition for Adequate School Housing. This is a part-time job for you and therefore we, we always expect you to have the wisdom of Solomon uh, because you come in from doing other things and then have to grapple with issues like this. What I would submit to you is that you made a commitment uh, a couple of months ago for priorities and funding. Uh, as uh, you identified, uh, Member Buchanan, uh, we have a high rate of unemployment. What I think 
that you should do with these funds is to make the commitment to fund projects that are, that are ready to go. You, you are oversubscribed in the, the recent funding priority round. Um, I know your staff has, has worked diligently to put these dollars numbers together. I think you could do this at the next meeting. I know your next item is, is an item that, that deals with uh, language for uh, regulation, uh, and I'll, I'll speak to that at the time. But uh, recognizing there's tremendous amount of need, if you have the, the oversubscribed a number of projects that you did have, uh, our recommendation would be for you to use these dollars to winnow down on those that, uh, that said that they would put their projects on the street in 90 days. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Just a okay. very, very quick comment. Uh, I would remind the board that uh, when we approved the regulations for construction ready, we had a discussion about whether site acquisitions should be part of that. I felt that it wasn't the hard hat kind of work. It was just architects and designers. <clears throat> site acquisition is still on that list and would be eligible. I will still support the project ready uh, option one because I think on balance it does what we all want, which is to put people to work and get the schools funded that need to be funded. Well, one of the speakers talked about the wisdom of Solomon, and so I would like to offer to split the baby here. And um, I, I do think that, and I'll just make my pitch one more time, I think charters are, are left in short shrift. You look at the Robert F. Kennedy School in LA Unified, this state bond money was close to $200 million, I believe, that went to that. And charters aren't getting any space at all in there. They build more facility for less dollar, and there's an article in the LA Times that quantified that, and yet we can't even get them money to get the design so they can get in line for money. I would suggest that we take $10 million of this. It has to be specific out of Prop uh, 1D or the LPP funds, I believe, but there's uh, $19.44 million, if I'm reading this right, that are available for that. Let's just take $10 million of that, put it to fund option three, then the rest of it to option one like you want to do. Then we have something for both. It's not a whole lot for that, but those architects and everything, those are jobs too, and they get just as much merit. They're still having to feed their kids at home also. So that would be my suggestion. And if appropriate, I would make that a motion. Could I Please have another suggestion? Um, I, I, I still feel very strongly that the money needs to go to shovel-ready projects, but I would, within that, I would maybe – um, since we ha it's going to have to come back to the next meeting anyway, if we could have agreement to that, maybe then staff could come back to us with um, a, a couple different funding priorities um, that we could then decide exactly how to, more specifics on how to allocate that at the next meeting. And, and I think, I think, uh, you know, I think, so. You, what? Well, I was just. Second, at least do the motion, then that would be. I'll awesome. second your motion. Okay, there's a motion and, and a second on, um, I'm sorry, we can restate it. Ten million. Ten million motion be $10 million toward option three with a balance um, going to 58.5 million going to option one. And, and then just to clarify, and then was it was it to include part of Buchanan's, which to have staff come back with no, options? No. no. Senator Huff, you, I think you mean option two, the priorities and funding, the right, shovel ready, the right? Two. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Just, yeah. just, can I just get a clarification then on the motion? I don't know what that means. I know it's ten million out of sixty. That's what I know, but I don't know what that means in terms of. It's ten million out of sixty-eight point five million. Oh, okay, sorry. And and it would. So, but 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 I just want to know, like, how many charter schools are we talking about? If you distribute the ten million dollars to the charter schools that are on the list, understanding that they're not going to be shovel ready, but we will get them to the place of plans completed, so forth and so on. What what are we talking about? The, the money would be made available. They would still have to come in and request the design or and or site acquisition. We do know that there are interested charter schools in obtaining this cash. Um, don't know exactly how much uh, the 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 total dollar figure is, um, but they have to come in and, and access and request the money. 
So it would be made available, then the charters could come in and request design and or site. Okay. Well, I'm reluctant to vote on the motion today. I'm, I'm very open to the discussion and looking at it, but I'm reluctant to just, you know, pull it out right now and vote, uh, you know, and vote on it. So I won't be voting for, the, for this at the moment, but I would certainly be open to the discussion uh, at our next meeting. I have a question. Are there charter school projects that are shovel ready that need money? I understand that. I just want to know if my question is: is are there whether you? I don't care. I just want to know if are there charter school projects that are shovel ready that need money that have gone through the design process? The designs are approved, and now they're shovel ready. There are some projects on the unfunded list. Um, I know that at least one that's on the unfunded list waiting for for cash that have come in with plans. Okay, um, so there's at least way one. Way up to the top of the list? They they wouldn't be part of this. They're in a separate list. This option oh. because we're just talking about the design and site. Why okay. couldn't they be part of this option? This is, just this is just for the ones to come in and access the design and or site. They're already... Uh, further ahead, they already actually have the plans approved. They already acquired the land if they needed to, and they've submitted a full funding application, and they received a, a, an unfunded approval. Now they're just awaiting um, cash on the unfunded list. But we could have a hybrid recommendation that would give priority to unfunded charters that are ground that are shovel ready. I mean, we don't, we don't, we aren't stuck with option one, two, three, or four. I mean, even your motion is a hybrid, so that um, you, you could have a hybrid then that would would give that priority. We could make Correct. it. We could do that. We could make a decision, like we made a decision last month to make put facility hardships at the top of the list. We could say that we want to reach down and grab a charter school off the list, but. Uh, not to be an advocate for the sanctity of the list, but it's obviously been drummed into me by all the people in this room that the that you know if we do that, that means we're going to pull a charter ahead of of you know somebody else's worthwhile projects in you know wherever it is, past Robles. Um, so so we so I I'm caught, I I'm concerned about that. So for that, I'm I'm also sympathetic that we have to get up these charter schools moving. And so I'm intending to support Senator Huff's motion. But go ahead. Did you want to say something else? Let me get something right here. On page 207, you say that there's $184 million in need for charter schools. And that what's available on the list of cash is just 19.44 if we added in the 706. That's correct. Is that correct? That's correct. And so we're looking at $1.3 billion in need on the unfunded list, but we're looking, no, for all schools, but we're looking at $184 million for charter schools. And again, that's just the total amount that they would be eligible for design in our site. That's all I wanted to know. I have one question, Senator Huff. Would you accept an amendment to your motion to include five million for the joint use shovel ready projects? Um, <clears throat> out of the pot for option two you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes. On the spillover after the ten million? The ten million. It's part of the spillover of the ten. Well, it would be ten million for charters. Right. Your motion, and then five million for joint use, and we'd have to create the authority, and then the spillover would go into two. Yeah, I would be open if I'm not losing other votes on it. <laughs> would you lose votes on that? I mean, my my only it, question is: Is that a deal we need to make today, or do we have to have agreement? To, my agree. What I would like to propose today that we all agree that the money go to <coughs> shovel-ready projects and allow staff to come back to us so we know exactly what the list look like at the next meeting. Because I feel like I'm making a decision here without even seeing the list. But it's not that I couldn't support it. Well, we're really like setting that. up a framework here, and right. you know, if we set it up in a colorblind manner, we're more likely to agree than if we start picking and choosing according to how it benefits our districts okay. or whatever it is. So, I mean, that, I think, is probably a little wiser way to go. The seconder will support your 
amended motion. Senator Hancock. Thank you. Um, I could go along with 10 million out of the 68 going to charter schools, understanding that we're putting architects to work as opposed to construction people to work. Um, but I think on the rest of it, I would like to follow up on what Ms. Moore said and prioritize joint use because you're getting communities things they can use as well as school districts. And I think, again, we're talking shovel ready. <laughs> They, they joint indicated to me that products. they are they are uh, they are DSA approved. There's five million that came in um, last that we mm -hmm. had in our report last month. That's what I'm talking about. So and and so there really isn't more than five million in joint use that's bid ready. Are we okay. moving up joint use then ahead of a school that has yes. 50 year old classrooms that need yes. to be repaired? Um, yeah. yeah, and because I want to encourage districts to do this. We have limited resources, as we live with every day in this state. There's no reason why we can't have beautiful joint use facilities and that, and that we should give a little something to the people that went out and formed the partnerships. And Madam, Madam Chair, I have a little bit of concern about prioritizing joint use. It might require some type of regulatory change for us to be able to move in that direction. Can I can I put um, <coughs> legal question um, for joint use? It comes up on a on a yearly basis, and the board has a practice in the past of when funding is available of putting funding into that to fund it. So this is not prioritizing or taking out of order or anything that the board has not previously done and via precedent. That may be correct. I'm not, uh, but I would like to. I haven't had a chance to look at that yet. Well, if we have, if it has. As staff works it, assuming this all passes, as staff works it out, if we come across a massive legal infirmity, we can deal with it at, the, at our next meeting. Or we, can, or we can beat the attorneys up, <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so we have a motion on the table. Did you want to restate it quickly for the record? Yeah, the motion would be to put $10 million into option three, $5 million into the, the joint use, and the balance into option two. And is, and is that your second? Second. Okay. Can you call the roll? Senator Lowenthal. Ready. So, let me understand. Ten million for for charter, for charter, charter schools. schools. Five million for so joint use. And to come back on option number two with a priority for those that are ready to go out for bid. And, right. And it's going to fund them, but we get the list. Right, we get the list. Okay. Senator Hancock. Hi. Can I clarify that the $10 million for charter, there's no priority for shovel ready in that? Mm -hmm. It's for planning. Okay. No, because it's planning. It, by definition, is not allowed for shovel ready. It's, it's pencil ready. Yeah. It, it, could be, it could be shovel ready. What do we he said it's he not. Said it's just for site acquisition oh, but, but, and for design but, but work. But there, there are, are charges. There are yeah. Yeah. Charter, yeah. But I'm not prioritizing because it's a different okay uh, Senator Huff I I already she said I uh, assembly member Brownlee no. okay assembly member Buchanan no. Scott Harvey Aye. Kathleen Moore Aye. Lynn Green I Cynthia Bryant I carries okay so item tab 13 and we don't have we have do not have our senators for too much longer, so. Okay. Tab 13 uh, is an item that proposes regulations to give the board the authority to create additional uh, funding priorities. As we just discussed, the, the board is interested in creating or considering additional funding priorities. This item includes regulations that gives the board the tools to establish a future funding priority. So what you see on tab on page 212 are regulations that, again, give the board the authority to create one in the event that the board chooses to move forward with the funding priority. The previous regulations that we had for the first round were specific to the 408.3 million and they sunset this year. These regulations don't specify a date or an amount so it would give the board the flexibility to create one on an as-needed basis. Uh, we think that they um, 
This has taken a proactive approach to give the board the tools and mechanism to make it uh, happen should the board decide to. So with that, Madam Chair, the, the regulations are ready for approval unless you have any questions. Can, can let me ask a question. So yes. if we approve these regulations today, then we could come back at the next meeting because it's an emergency and we'd be able to come back in the next meeting and put whatever the whatever the change is from 68 minus 15. Um, we would be able to do that and get this, make the motion next time and, and open a round of priorities and funding. Yes, the board will have the flexibility to um, determine the dates and the amounts for the next funding priority at the next board or, or, or in the future. I move adoption of the proposed Second. amendments. Is there any public comment on this item? Cash again in, in, in support of the, in, the endeavor that, that is before you, as I noted before. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to frame that letter that has everybody agreeing to something. <laughs> yes. Put it on my wall. Impressive. Impressive. Uh, okay, call the roll. Uh, Senator Hancock. Aye. Senator Huff. Aye. Assemblymember Brownlee. Aye. Assemblymember Buchanan. Aye. Scott Harvey. Aye. Kathleen Moore. Aye. Lynn Green. Aye. Cynthia Bryant. Aye. Carries. Okay, with, if everyone can hang for just another couple minutes, let's go ahead and do tab 14. We'll finish the agenda. Um, so go ahead, Juan. Tab 14 deals with, um, it provides the board several options for ordering projects that are received by the OPSC on the same date. Um, as you all know, at the last board meeting, we were able to provide apportionments of 78 projects for a total of 408.1 million. However, we did have 19 projects that were received on the same date. And we had to, we were only, only able to fund 11 out of those 19 projects. So the board requested that staff come back and consider uh, a different mechanism for ordering the projects. What we did at the last board and what we did since the inception of the unfunded list is we used a numbering system. And if I can draw your attention to the middle of page 215, we used what we call the uh, OPSC project number to order the projects. The first two numbers of the program code, in this case it's 50. This represents a new construction project and each type of project has a different two number. So if you have like a modernization project that would be a 57. We looked at that number first and ordered it from lowest to highest. Then we moved into the district five digit code, again from lowest to highest. Then the next two digit number is the district high school attendance area whether the district had one or not. Usually if a district does not have a high school attendance area, it's denoted as 00. And then finally, we went through and looked at the uh, project number. That's the system that we use since the assumption of the unfunded list. It's what the board adopted at the last board. So this item uh, considers a different alternative, which was to consider a lottery system if we get to a point where we don't have enough cash to fund all projects that are received by the OPSC on the same date. So if we look at stamp page 216, we provided several options for the board. The first option basically um, keeps business as usual. We keep the same system and only in the event that we do not have enough cash to fund all projects that are received on the same date, we will do a lottery system. And the lottery system will give each project that received on the same day uh, a, a different priority based on this lottery and we would fund the next project in line. The only thing that I wanted to note here is that I'd like to move the staff recommendation for oh. option one. I don't Second. Know. Okay. <laughs> Woo. Thank you. So we've already, I just don't see any re need to correct okay. or to create additional work for staff but I do believe in those the rare instances where where you can't fund an entire day, that there should be a, a random selection. And I think the staff one meets, or option one, excuse me, meets that requirement. Okay. okay. I mean, the only thing that I was thinking about is that, that, you know, if you, when you executed number one, that there was some notification so that people can be present for the lottery pick. Absolutely. And that's, that is our intent. We want to make it open and transparent and available to the public. We can do it here, board meeting. No. <laughs> no. no. Okay. All right. Um, call the roll. 
Uh, Senator Hancock? Aye. Senator Huff? Aye. Assemblymember Brownlee? Aye. Assemblymember Buchanan? Aye. Scott Harvey? Aye. Kathleen Moore? Aye. Lynn Green? Aye. Cynthia Bryant? Aye. Carries. Okay, then. So our next meeting is Oct October 6th. Um, Madam Chair? Yes, yeah, Madam. Can I just say, I know that um, tab 15, the high performance yeah. school tab, was simply a report. I, I just wanted to say that I think that we've received the report. I don't think we should re accept the report, however, until um, the details of the final MOU are available to us. When, I, when we did that item, I actually just presented it myself and said that our converse, the conversations with DSA and, and, and CHIPS have been going very well. I've been meeting with them weekly, and I think next Bless week you. we'll finish and we'll bring an item, hopefully, knock on wood. We didn't yeah. accept anything. Okay, they great. So, my word. so hopefully we'll come back with an MOU with and everybody will be happy. There's a lot of determination on both sides. I think we'll make it. Thank you, thank and, you. And also, for the members that were absent earlier, on all of the report items, OPSC and DGS have offered to come brief anybody who wants to ask any specific questions. Oh, that last item did have two parts. I don't believe we voted on the part two. Right. Okay. On the type. Or on the type, or yes. Or or was it just accept staff recommendation, which was both? Yeah. Both. I thought staff recommendation for option one. Was right. One staff one. recommendation. Yes. Yes. Both and we're going to use bingo right. Yes. Both, both parts, both parts yes. yes. Staff recommendation. Do we need to call the room? Right. Okay. So what? Dates. Yeah. October 6th is our next board meeting. It's not a perfect answer. A lot. No one can come to all the dates, and so it was the best option that we had on the table. So, any public comment on items not on the agenda? All right, this meeting's adjourned. There we go.